Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equait Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. Hello and a very warm welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I can see some ladies in the audience. It's nice, uh, it's nice to know I'm not alone. So I salute you ladies present in the audience today. So welcome back to day two of the Kayaks CS Conference 2014. Fabulous to have so many of you joining us again today. So just a quick reminder of some of those house rules. May we remind you all to pop those mobiles onto silent. Don't forget that the prayer rooms are located out of any of the doors on your left, and then they are right at the end on the right. Smoking is strictly for outside only. Remember, it's out of the main doors, and then veer to the left, and you will find a shaded area. And do remember to be here today at 3.15 for yet another draw, which I'm sure promises to be as exciting as yesterday, but hopefully not quite as long. So do be with us physically present at 3.15 this afternoon. Remember the rules, you need to be here physically present. And last but not least, should any of you require interpretation headphones, then they are located at the middle doors. Um, could you just wave at me, sir? The gentleman who is giving out those headphones, there he is. Friendly, warm and welcoming and ready to distribute should you need them. So ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. Who is our first speaker today? Well, it's Michael Poria, who is the Managing Director of Pro Protivity Consulting Firm. And today he's gonna to be speaking on the subject of securing SCADA systems, thought and considerations. And with over 20 years of experience in, in executing and managing IT risk consultancy, it is a delight to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our first speaker this morning, Michael Poria. Good morning. Can you hear me okay out there? There we go. Um, Thank you for having me. My name is Michael Poirier. I'm with Protivity Risk Consulting. And so what we do as part of Protivity is we go out to organizations and we do assessments on their, their networks and their SCADA systems. Protivity is a business and technology risk consulting practice and also with internal audit activities. So I'm going to take this a little bit from an internal audit approach. We're going to talk a little bit about the regulations that are out there that we work with within the United States to have broader reach and how we work with those regulations to do our assessments um, on the SCADA networks and cybersecurity at large. And so we're going to approach it a little bit from that standpoint. So I start with this quote from Obama a couple of years ago. This was the first recognition, public recognition, that there had been a breach or an attempted breach on some of the electric grid within the United States. So it was noted just because it was that first public recognition that cybersecurity does exist, even though it hadn't been talked about a lot in the past. There was a recognition that the infrastructure needed to be protected and measures needed to be put in place. Just a couple of months ago, um, in March, SANS, which is one of the more widely recognized training organizations for IT security professionals, they commented on a survey that they did for SCADA networks, um, and they indicated that there were 28, or the increase from events for organizations for cybersecurity increased from 28 to nearly 40% in one year. 
And they said only 9% can say with any surety that they have not been breached. So again, just very real-time recognition that some of these events are occurring. I pulled this out in the paper yesterday. This is from the Arab Times. This was in the newspaper just yesterday morning. And there's some quotes in here that I want to read out because it parallels a lot of what you heard yesterday in some of the presentations. So it says, in recent weeks, the security community has been rocked by news, a massive breach at online giant eBay, affecting as many as 145 million customers, following the hit by as many as 110 million at the retailer Target. So again, if you haven't heard, eBay recently hit as well. They're encouraging everyone to change their passwords from that event already. The incidents highlight huge gaps in cybersecurity or the case in which malicious actors can break into a single computer and subsequently penetrate a network or cloud. The old model for cybersecurity does not work, says James Lewis of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's getting worse and getting out of control. One of the dilemmas is that when people have a choice between security and utility, they often choose utility. We heard that very specifically in a presentation yesterday. right? You got the CIA components of security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. On the SCADA side, organizations have often chosen the utility component, the availability of that network, which places greater risk at some of the security components. It goes on further to say that a new cyber defense system aimed at thwarting attacks before they happen with prevent preventive analytics is being unveiled. Before others in cyber but others in cybersecurity dispute that approach. The idea of predicting and halting attacks, they say, is, quote, utter nonsense. Um, one individual said that it's, he views it as unlikely the ability to pick through the noise to find the bad guy before he does it, any bad thing. One of the researchers said that hardware isolation is an approach that they are considering. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but it's just one of the new options being explored. He said that in hunting for malware, you cannot come up with a list of everything that is bad, but what you can do is enumerate what is supposed to be there. This whitelist approach has a higher chance of success. The old notion of using antivirus software, which updates itself based on new malware signatures, is rapidly losing credence. The whitelist comment, again, is something that was explicitly noted yesterday in the presentations. There has to be a way to notate within the network exactly the sites that we need to go to, exactly the protocols that are allowed on the network, and secure it in that manner rather than the opposite. And so a lot was talked about yesterday in regards to SCADA networks and why they are vulnerable. You know, when we go out and talk to clients, you know, it is noted that they are different than, from the enterprise systems. They're the hidden network that's out in the field. You know, the, the notion is that, ah, oh, the hardware guys, the engineers, they'll take care of the, the SCADA systems and the process control systems. We don't have to worry about that. That notion is evaporating as more of those systems are being taken over by the IT department and controlled together and collaboratively. But that notion still exists. You can't see the, some of these systems. Um, they've got old historical hardware. Um, and so it's a little bit different than just going in and looking at corporate systems. So some of the challenges that have existed out there, you know, we used to think these systems were air-gapped, and they were, but that's no longer the case. Now there's the need for this real-time data to come in from the field to go directly into management reports, which means you have to have that interconnectivity through the internet and through your networks to get that information. You no longer can have that delay in getting this, this information. But the SCADA networks weren't really designed for that. Right? They were, these are now complex systems. You've got distributed components across a broad area. The patching, the rebooting, the authentication of these uh, can be complex. You also have some, some of the old systems in these SCADA environments have very limited computational power. They're historically connected via very low speed serial lines, therefore the protocols tended to be quite simple. Right? And they often cannot be relied upon. They weren't built with security in mind. 
They weren't built to be able to protect against spoofing or replay attacks or some of the variety of the denial of service attacks that are out there. Likewise, in some of the industrial plants, these were built to be multi-decade type of infrastructures. And the thought is a lot of the equipment would go out there and stay for many decades, including some of the network equipment, which is opposed to some of the equipment on the enterprise side to where you're replacing it every three to five years. Right? But out in the SCADA systems, we've gone out into the field and seen systems that are no longer even being supported. The vendor of some of the equipment in the field may, no, may not even exist. And so the, all of this information or all the technology needs to be refreshed, but that's part of the challenge in that environment. Likewise, some of the master terminal units um, were historically Unix-based. A lot of that is now Microsoft-based, but with the Unix-based system, you didn't often have to worry quite so much about the antivirus and some of the vulnerabilities that were out there. With Microsoft, now it requires some of the patching to be in place. Likewise, with um, you know, some of the Microsoft um, operating systems no longer being available, you know, we've got um, some of those are no longer being supported. Therefore, you've got to go through and make sure that your systems can handle the new operating systems that are out there and available. So all this comes into play when we're talking about the SCADA environment and how this information needs to be collected in a more real-time environment. So I want to talk a little bit about the frameworks and the standards that are out there that, that we use. Again, we're coming at it more from an audit approach. Um, I know there's some frameworks that were talked about yesterday in regards to specific SCADA environments, but some of these speak to the frameworks that are out there more from a, a U.S. national level and then also some at the industry level. And so we got NIST that's out there, which sponsors the, the FISMA, or the Federal Information Security Management Act. You know, these are requirements for the federal government agencies within the United States where they are required to have certain security measures in place for those organizations. What is happening now, especially with the new framework that's being pushed out, is that we're seeing a lot of the pressure being put on not just federal agencies, but any agency who receives support from the federal government to make sure they've got security measures in place to be able to protect their environment. And so I work a lot in the government sector in Houston, um, both with the city of Houston, Harris County, and some other municipalities, and if they are gonna receive federal funding, they have to now start demonstrating that they've got some security controls documented and well controlled. They have to show how it's been tested. And this is not just for federal agencies, it's for anybody working with the federal government now, which is also going to start affect corporations and international governments as well. Anyone who is working with the United States federal government is gonna to have to be able to demonstrate that they comply with some of these security measures, okay? Some of these security measures are actually quite general, so it'll be interesting to see this evolve and see if they're gonna add some more teeth into this and how they're gonna control it. Uh, but that is out there on the horizon. COBIT is a nice set of standards. It, it's got some nice granularity with respect to the IT controls. And then ISO, we talked about that as well yesterday. There are some specific industry standards that are out there that we see quite a bit. In the United States, the North America, America Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, before anyone can connect or provide electricity to the U.S. grid, you've got to be in compliance with some of the NERC SIP standards. Okay? Um, a pretty exhaustive list of how you're going to uh, control security and implement controls on all parts of that network if you're providing um, any service to the electric grid. Likewise, CFATS, if you're operating in a chemical facility, um, there's a whole set of measures you have to be aware of there. Um, FEMSA, if you're working in pipeline and hazardous material safety, and PCI, I put that in here. I'm not sure if any of you have retail components within your organizations to where you process credit cards, but there are some nice parallels with PCI and credit card processing that may need to be thought of in regards to SCADA, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, I do a lot of work with the credit card industry and in securing networks and the rigor and the level of detail required by PCI 
um, can be a great standard for this industry as well. So let me go back and talk about NIST a little bit. Again, with President Obama a couple of years ago indicating that, hey, this is a real threat, um, he put an executive order out to say that we need a framework together for improving the critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, as he called it, um, for the United States. And so he, he directed NIST to work with the stakeholders to develop this voluntary framework. In February of this year, it came out. Um, so we started taking a look at the detail of this framework and what it really provides. And it's meant to be a version one that'll be continuously updated as they work with some of the stakeholders uh, to determine what's gonna work for this environment. But by and large, if you go through and you look at the detail, it's not all that different from some of the other measures that are out there. Let me back up one. So if you look at the detail in the framework, and again, it is a framework, they've got 97 controls spread over five different functions. Those five functions being identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. These controls are actually, if you go through and take a look at them, are actually quite general. Um, somewhat disappointingly general. And that's why I bring in the concept of PCI. So if you look at PCI, there's over 230 controls in the latest version, and they're extremely granular. So let me read to you a little bit of the difference between some of the controls here for this framework versus PCI. So in, in this framework, it says data at rest is protected. That's, that's it, that's all it's got for, for a bullet point for what you need to put into the cybersecurity framework. It's got another one that says protections against data leaks are implemented. Well, that could be a number of things. That could be policies, that could be tools, it could be processes. It leaves so much up to the end user to determine what they want to put in and the level of risk they want to accept in that network. Now, let me read something in the PCI language and you'll see the difference. Part of a, a PCI requirement says, observe an administrator log on to each system and examine system configurations to verify strong encryption method is, is being invoked before the administrator passwords is requested. Very specific, very granular. You not only have to go through and test exactly what's being done, but here's the evidence in the way that you've got to do it. It says, describe how the administrator logged on to each type of system so each operating system, each database, each instance of that system that's in scope, you have to have evidence of how they logged on and observe to verify that strong encryption method is invoked before they, the password is requested. Describe how system configurations for each system were examined to verify that strong encryption methodology is invoked. Um, and describe the encryption being used, the length of the key, and the type of encryption that it is. It's very granular. Um, and the other thing that, that parallels PCI to some of the SCADA environment is that you know, PCI does a great job of saying as credit cards go through the environment, you almost treat it as like radioactive information, right? Everywhere that credit card number touches your network, that's a system that is in scope for the requirements of PCI that has to be evaluated. Not only that, but if you've got a flat network, Every system that is connected to that system also has to be evaluated, right? And that makes sense because if you can jump on one machine and escalate privileges so that you have access to all the machines in a flat network, then yet all of it is exposed. But what they concentrate on in PCI is saying, how do we reduce the scope of what our risk is? How do we push that down? Well, we do that by segmenting the environment either with virtual LANs or with firewall segmentation or whatever that may be, so that we reduce our footprint as small as possible. And then all the PCI requirements apply to the machines and the devices within that scope area. SCADA can be the same way. As you've got that network out there and you're identifying and putting that circle around those types of systems, all the requirements here can apply to all those systems, but the more, the more segmented you have it, the better off you're gonna be because you're lessening the risk of somebody from outside being able to get in. 
And so take a look at that framework. It may just be helpful in understanding um, exactly what the risk may be. So I mentioned we go out and we do audits of engagement of environments and, and for corporations. And we talk to them and, and looking at where do the SCADA systems exist? How do we go out there and review it? What do we want as part of the scope of that evaluation? Um, and we work with companies in Houston. We have a lot of energy companies there. They have a lot of SCADA environments in different locations. And so some of the results of some of the audits that we've done are quite startling. You would expect or hope that some of the security measures have been in place on these environments since they've been out there for so long. We had a team go out into a field site, go to a remote terminal, be able to plug in their PC. There was no, no restriction in regards to the port being locked down. There was no intrusion detection to be able to detect that they plugged in, no network access control, no cameras. They plugged into the, to that terminal and were able to run scans across the network. Okay. They determined by doing that that they could actually reach any part of the network because it wasn't segmented. So from a field location, they were able to run their tools, gain access to some privileged accounts, and access corporate systems all the way back at the main headquarters, which is a really scary thought. Okay. No controls out in the field to be able to prevent information or scanning going that way because they said, well, Typically, you know, they, don't, they weren't really accounting for that type of risk. They didn't see it as a high risk. They didn't want to put controls in place to manage that. We had another engagement where we started at corporate and started to see what we could see just for their environment. They thought that their SCADA system was segmented off and that you couldn't access it. So as we went through and scanned their system, it, it wasn't completely flat, but it was mostly flat to where we were able to get into what they thought was a segmented environment um, and gain access to the SCADA components. Part of the challenge in this scenario was that all the system administrators used the same, not the same password, but they used their own same password for all the devices that they were managing, right? Probably a very common occurrence. You got one password being used in multiple different ways across the organization by those super users. What happens when that user leaves, right? There's a lot of turnover in the energy industry these days for certain positions and in certain locations. When that person leaves, are they going through and resetting those passwords? You know, it's a super user. This is, you know, a highly privileged account. What can they gain access to? We gained access to that super user account and were able to own the network, essentially, um, in a very short period of time. We could send commands to any of the SCADA components from the corporate location um, and demonstrate that we were able to do that. So it was mentioned quite a bit yesterday that you have to have layers of security, right? IT security is not something you can just go buy and plug in. It's not a piece of hardware or software that you could just go implement and suddenly you're done. It's a whole separate layer of controls you have to put on top of each other to make sure that it all works correctly. And so part of our challenge is trying to explain to management, being in risk management, what level of risk are you accepting when you go through and do, when we put controls in, you know, what are you left with? What's the residual risk? And so we use a tool called the Capability Maturity Model. This was developed by Carnegie Mellon. And we use this to, to talk about how mature certain processes are. And so if you look at a low maturity process, we call that ad hoc. And you escalate up in maturity through due diligence, controlled, well-managed, and world-class. Not every company is going to operate at world class, nor should it. It costs a lot of money, right? And you're still going to have some risk, even if you're operating at that world class level. But this is a great tool for us to visit with executive management and say, where do you want to be? So we'll come in, we'll do our assessment, we'll look at the controls, 
And for each one of these security verticals, we'll draw a line and say you're operating in approximately the due diligence mode or the controlled mode. You are behind your peers within the industry who are operating at a higher standard. Is this where you want to be? Right? And so it's a great mechanism to present to executive management and say, you've got all this other risk that you're exposed to. Let's, let's at least recognize that and understand you could put in measures to make it a tighter environment. Um, it's going to cost a little more money, but it's going to reduce your risk profile down to something that may be more manageable or more acceptable. So we use this tool a great deal in talking to management to say, if you don't want to implement all these controls, that's okay, but let's at least sign off here that this is the risk profile that we want to operate under, um, and we recognize the residual risk that's out there. Okay? And we do it vertical by vertical. And we'll often, if we want to start explaining it, start talking about the physical security components, because that's something they can easily understand. Right? You can, I've got credit card environments and um, energy trading organizations to where you've got biometric access controls in order to get into those portions of the building. It's a very strong, very high level of access. And we've got a much, much more detailed and granular view of this that we present to clients when we start talking about all the controls. But this is a great way to talk about risk, to talk about controls, and what level are you comfortable with from a risk standpoint. So we tried to collapse some of the security measures and mitigation measures into a couple of slides here that we um, have presented to clients in the past. You know, the first one here being evaluate, isolate, and test all your connections to the SCADA networks. Again, great parallels to the PCI environment. In PCI, for everywhere that's, for all those in-scope systems, You've got to understand every connection point into that environment. Likewise, for SCADA, you need to understand where can you connect into these systems. And a lot of times, we're looking at vendors as well, right? If you look at the target breach, it was vendor access that enabled a large part of that breach, right? So taking a look at what level of access your vendors have, what are your contracts in place with them, um, how are they managing passwords and authentication on their side? That's going to be a critical piece to this as well. Um, but mapping this out and understanding all these connection points um, is a really big deal. We also see, especially for the SCADA networks, this was mentioned yesterday as well, there's a lot of different communication mechanisms in play. With all the different wireless, you've got satellite, um, you know, all the, the different forms of communication need to be evaluated to see what the protocols are that are running um, because a lot of the old protocols simply just don't work anymore. Once you know exactly what all those access points are to the environment, then working to harden those networks and systems is, is of key importance. We go through and we'll evaluate the results as to why we can hack into an environment, right? And we go through and we work with organizations. We've got a very good hacking team. We've got a group of white hat hackers that sit in the lab and, and they're very good at what they do. They can hack in from the outside, we'll bring them on site, they can get in from the inside. Um, and a, we go through and analyze the results and figure out, well, how, how do we gain access? Because executives want to know. And a large part of it is because, not because of you know, something really sophisticated that we did, it's because of the really easy stuff that we do. So if 90% you know, of the breaches could be eliminated if organizations did the simple things, if they just put in the basic security measures and they did them well, okay? So the capability maturity model that I showed a while ago can be used in two different ways. It can talk about the design of the control or the working effectiveness of that control, depending on how you use it, right? And if it's not working effective, then it doesn't really matter if you have those things in place. <clears throat> but hardening those systems and making sure that 
Those controls are in place, all those parameters, I'll get a slide here in a minute to touch on those. That's of key importance. Um, implementing a vulnerability management program, again, is another big one. We see a lot of, of our clients really struggling with you know, what logging, what SIM tools do we need to put in? How do we aggregate that information? How do we make sense of it? Because there's so much noise out there in these environments that they have to make use of it. They have to make sense of it and put it into a tool and do the alerting. They just don't do it well. There's not a great system out there for managing that type of activity. But that vulnerability system or vulnerability management program um, does need to be in place and is very helpful for organizations to be able, for them to be able to run their own scans and, and fix them. I worked with a client a couple of weeks ago. They said, yeah, we've got a vulnerability management program. I said, great, let's talk about it. Let's see what tools you're using. Let's see how you're aggregating the information. And it turns out they were doing scans great but they weren't doing anything with the scan results. They didn't actually go through and, and put the remediation measures in place because it started piling up and becoming such a large, momentous project that they just kind of pushed it out of the way and they couldn't get to a lot of those upgrades and patches. It doesn't do any good to have this, the scanning in place if you're not gonna follow up on it, which speaks to, again, you've got to do the basic things well. Um, from an authentication standpoint, when we go through and we do these hacks, the other thing that we'll do is we'll do the social engineering, right? And those are a lot of fun. There's four different impacts to the social engineering. We've got the physical penetration attempt where we'll try and get into the data center and see if we can be caught. We've got the telephonic attempts where we can actually pick up the phone. For 25 bucks, you can buy a piece of software that makes it look like you're dialing from your office um, or uh, dialing from the client's office while we do it from our office. All right, it's easy to do, and we've got the scripts laid out to say, hey, we're, we're in IT, we need you to reset your password, I'm going to send you a link, follow this link so that we can uh, go forward with the types of things that we need to do to reconfigure the network. We've got phishing campaigns. We'll put a phishing site together that looks very real um, and send those out to a, a select number of the individuals. Or we'll do the USB drops. We'll put programs on USBs, lay them in a common area, and see who will pick them up and plug them in. And of course, we label the files on there, like payroll information or spring break pictures or something that we know they're going to pick up and plug in. But you know the number of people that will actually give us information when we do these phishing attacks or telephonic attacks? About 30%. 30% of the people that we send this out to will give us some information about themselves, the company, the network, or their passwords. And it's a whole lot easier from a hacker perspective to hack into a network if you've got individuals volunteering to say, hey, use my password, try this. Makes it a whole lot easier. Um, so communicating to your employees and doing the training is going to be of real importance. Now, I mentioned before all of our breaches occur, or most of them occur, because the simple things are not being done. These are the simple things. These are the basic things, the basic types of controls that need to be in place for any environment. Making sure the corporations do each of these well is of critical importance. I'm going to skip this last slide, but it, it'll be in your program. It talks a little bit about um, how to put forward and establish a security program within the corporation. Um, but hopefully we've provided you some information in regards to the controls that are out there, some of the frameworks that we look at, and some of the success stories that we've had in trying to hack into organizations and the SCADA networks. I'll be available if you've got any questions on the break, so feel free to come by. Um, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.